Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Zelený, uh, and this is the replacing Jan with the NF talk. Uh, so I will start with a question that I actually got earlier from Matthew. This question was, didn't we already do that? Uh, yes, we did, and that's why you can see the retrospective back there. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do is, in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to tell you something about uh, what happened, how we did things, why we did them, uh, stuff like that. And then we're going to move forward to what's ahead of us, because the migration is still not completed. Uh, so, uh, this, is, this might be opposite to what the description of the talk said, but uh, you will see that the first part is actually useful to understand the second part of the presentation. Uh, so, anyway, so anyway, I have a lot of stuff, so if you have any questions, please uh, say them for, for the end of the presentation. And with that, I should probably state what are the goals of my presentation. Uh, so first of all, I hope this presentation will help the audience understand why things uh, are the way they are. Uh, second of all, this is about self-reflection uh, because not everything well went well and we want, to, we want to show you that we acknowledge our mistakes and we want to learn from them. We also accept feedback, so if, you, if there is anything you don't like about the presentation, uh, just come and grab me afterwards and uh, tell me what you would like uh, instead. And most importantly, this is generally not about individual bugs or RFPs that you might have. I trust uh, there is a few of those, a uh, few of you as well, who have individual problems with uh, DNF. Again, I can discuss those with you after the presentation if I'm knowledgeable. I should state that I'm not actually on the development team, uh, I'm just the manager, so I can talk about the high level stuff, but uh, I'm not sure about the team time details. So, uh, let's, let's take a look at the topics, so retrospective that's going to be uh, about, that's going to go way back, like when the development started. The NF 1.0, that's more about recent history, like right, what happened right before Fedora 22 went GA. Uh, and these two will hopefully give you the background to understand what is planned, and if there is time for that, uh, I also prepared a couple of slides with a bit of controversy. Uh, okay, so let's let's deep let's dive deep into the history and start with the positive stuff. So, uh, what went well in the DNF development? Getting early adopters was definitely one of the things that, uh, in my perspective, we did very well uh, because we managed to get out the early announcement that this is going to happen. Uh, the announcement went out uh, almost 15 months before the target release of Fedora. And thanks to that, uh, after many, many flame wars on Fedora Devil List, we are able to pinpoint some specific problems that were major and uh, should be uh, addressed. And we managed to address them. Protected packages uh, functionality is one of them. Uh, and I'm sure I could come up with a couple more at least. Uh, uh, problem with that was that the community of early adopters covered only a small part of DNF users. Uh, and therefore, it covered only a small part of the DNF functionality. Uh, I will talk about that in a, in a little while. And we didn't succeed to reach out of this uh, rather small group of users who were like enthusiastic about DNF and wanted to try that and were quite happy about it. Most of the people that tried DNF for the first time, they encountered a problem, they were just done with it. Which I can understand as a user, uh, just that we didn't uh, manage to uh, get them on board and that could have gone better. So, uh, what what else went well? Use case driven development. That's something that we do today. And uh, basically bottom line is that we do not automatically implement what a single user asks for. Uh, we try to listen to our users, uh, but only as a group. And the, the reason is that some requests are contradictory. So what we try to do is we try to uh, figure out what is the reason 
what is uh, what is, what is the reason for the request? What is actually the problem that the user is trying to solve? Uh, that will usually give us a clear indication as to what is important, what is not important, and why it is important. That's the most important part. Uh, and thanks to this approach, we already managed to uh, identify and uh, merge some duplicated functionalities. Uh, for example, in YAM, there were some plugins who were doing uh, partially the same job as other plugins. So uh, we managed to uh, merge it into, into one uh, piece of code, one place where you can call that functionality. Uh, the problem with this approach is that the development process takes a bit longer. Because in some cases, especially the, those cases that we don't understand or the development team doesn't understand, uh, they need to figure out what the problem is. Uh, they need to understand it. They need to uh, make themselves wear uh, the shoes of others, right? So yeah, and that takes time. And what also happens from time to time that the development team uh, can be perceived uh, as unwilling to cooperate. Because instead of just getting the code in there, just merging the patch, just getting the stuff fixed, they ask you a bunch of questions. And when you answer, they will ask you another bunch of questions. And the reason is exactly for, the, uh, for that. They want to understand you. They want to understand what you're going through. They want to understand if there is a way how to solve your problem differently, maybe. Maybe in a more efficient way. So, uh, another, another positives. Uh, so these are actually three aspects that, from, uh, from my point of view, differentiate the DNF development from the YAM development. Uh, so first of all, unit testing. DNF has an extensive unit test suite. And I mean really extensive. And the policy uh, is that no code should go in that is untested or that is not covered by a test suite. So if there is a new code or if there are substantial changes in the old code, unit tests are all, all, always required. That's why if some of you send patches to DNF, uh, those patches might have been rejected because they didn't include unit tests. Uh, CI. Uh, this actually shows that the testing is uh, really important in the development process of DNF. Uh, currently our CI uh, is directly uh, connected to GitHub so every pull request that comes in is tested first and then it's reviewed. And If the test suite fails it's up to you to fix the pull request before anyone can actually review it. Uh, test suite is, like I said, it's uh, running uh, every single time and it runs on all the components because it's not just DNF uh, there are other libraries beneath DNF and they have test suites as well uh, documentation uh, we try to stress the importance of documentation as much as possible because from our point of view the documentation defines our API you probably know that in Python you can basically take, well, almost anything that you want and you can, you can use it. Uh, you can use the internalness of DNF, but when you come to us and uh, you tell us like, guys, this stopped working, fix that. We'll take a look at the documentation and we'll say, we'll say yeah, okay, so this is part of the documentation, we will fix it. Or, this is not part of the documentation, you should not be using it. If you want to, if you want this functionality, file a, file an RFP. We'll take a look at uh, we'll take a look at the existing interface, and maybe we will just take an internal method and make it a part of API, or we will implement something else if it's uh, if it's a better choice. But the point is that the documentation is imp really important for those consumers uh, that try to connect to the Python API of DNF. And the documentation is also important for users because DNF is a little different than YAM. And documentation is also important for uh, developers who want to join. Uh, so we have a nice guide how to get started with DNF. And Nick uh, over there 
compiled an RFP to extend this guy to make the development on top of DNF even more simple. And not just on top of DNF, but the development of DNF itself for newcoming developers. So let's take a look at some negatives. Uh, poor stabilization goals. So even though we announced uh, the release of DNF and the repla replacement of YAM quite early, people didn't test as much of the code base as we had hoped. And that led us to making wrong, wrong assumptions about what is necessary to make or to declare DNF stable. Uh, so originally we had only five goals, five major goals, which is not that many. Uh, and we said, okay, after we do these five goals, after, do these, after we do these five uh, enhancements, we're good to go. We can, we can drop it there and everything will be okay. That obviously was a huge mi mistake and it reflected badly on us uh, as users got mad about important things we did not encounter before or we did not consider important uh, because things didn't work for some of the users. Mm -hmm. So uh, this should have, been, uh, should have been approached better. And another thing is that some parts of DNS, DNF uh, were implemented quite late. Uh, like the migration plugin, for instance, which led to problems uh, in Fedora 22 Alpha or Beta, was it? I'm not sure at this moment. Basically, these, fun these functions did not work like at all because they were untested. We were uh, under a lot of stress and we didn't manage to get them done on time. Uh, okay, some other negatives. Outgoing communication, and this is a very important one. This is basically why I'm doing this presentation. So we figured out that this needs to be improved in general, but mostly in terms of transparency of the development process uh, for the community. Uh, because we, uh, in our development process, we do a lot of decisions. And some of those decisions are not clear to the community and to the users, so we need to come forth and we need to explain why are we making decisions the way we are. Uh, so examples, there are examples throughout the last year like uh, what is the reason for, for the YAM and DNF change, uh, what are DNF's goals and priorities, uh, what, that it is actually going to happen because to the very last moment some people didn't believe that the YAM was getting replaced. And yeah, I mean, some of the, desi some of the desi design decisions uh, were not communicated properly, which led to all sorts of confusions. Uh, I will cover some of them uh, later. Uh, so let's take a look at DNF 1.0. So this part will be about what was the development all about around F22 GA. So uh, first of all, it was all about migration of application. So this was one of the things that uh, we actually started pretty late in the development cycle because we did the initial inspection in January. Um, and it turned out that uh, there is a lot of stuff that depends on YAM. Big surprise, huh? Oh, who could have known? <laughs> uh, we should have, I know. Uh, anyway, so our, uh, our idea was to first of all, migrate all the stuff uh, that is in the base installation of Fedora. And by base installation, I mean all three products. So we identified all the components in all three products, including, uh, including the base, uh, and yeah, three products and the base. And we told, uh, uh, we told ourselves, okay, let's start with these. Let's make sure these uh, use DNF instead of YAM. And if they do, we are pretty much good to go. So. Uh, the goal was to not have YAM in the standard installation of Fedora. Uh, the second step was to migrate all the YAM plugins. Uh, turned out there is a lot of YAM plugins. Uh, some of them are not maintained anymore. Some of them might be doing some stuff that uh, no, one, no one cares about. I think there's two of those. Uh, so yeah, that was the that was the second step. Uh, the first step, uh, the third step, was and still is to migrate all the applications that are heavily used. 
but how you identify those? Well, turns out our users know uh, and our user, users tell us that something should be migrated. Uh, and as a, yeah, as a fourth step, uh, the idea is to migrate all the applications uh, with active and approachable maintainers. And obviously the rest of the application, uh, the rest of the applications, uh, we need to solve that on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, if it's possible to solve, I mean, uh, those applications with dead upstreams and uh, like uh, maintainers that don't care much, uh, it's not really much we can do about those, at least not in the foreseeable future. So, yum deprecated. Uh, to this day, I think that was a, that was a good idea to have this one, even though some users on Fedora Devil list didn't think so. The idea of YAM deprecated was to have basically a symlink from YAM to DNF. Uh, similarly, uh, all those like uh, all those all those tools like repo query and stuff like that should still be there in case you need them for some reason, because you know DNF is not 100. Percent compatible with YAM, and it can happen that someone relies on some functionality that is not yet migrated to DNF, and uh, it's not going to be for maybe for some time. I don't know. So the idea was to keep YAM a little longer in Fedora and see what is critically missing uh, in DNF. Uh, the way we did it, uh, you probably, you guys probably know, we basically. Uh, warn users that the old YAM commands are deprecated and DNF should be used instead if possible. And then we try to redirect to, to DNF. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is because we want to push users towards DNF, at least a little bit, uh, because, well, who knows how long YAM is going to be around. Uh, well, I know. <laughs> at least I hope I know, but uh, I will share with you in a little bit, in a little while. Uh, so yeah, uh, and the plan is to keep the YAM deprecated only as a backup, not to add uh, too much functionality, uh, provide some critical fixes. Uh, I mean, uh, since then we implemented a bunch of features, uh, but only only those that made sense, from at least from a certain standpoint. Uh, and yeah, uh, a part of the a part of the yum uh, yum deprecated. Uh, yeah, a part of this plan is to have a migration plugin and man man page yum to DNF. Basically, the migration plugin is supposed to migrate your yum database to DNF because there might be some data that is valuable to you. And the man to DNF uh, man page yum to DNF is supposed to give you some idea as to what is the new command that replaces the old command that you were used to, something like that, or covers some config options, I think, as well. Uh, and yeah, um, one thing we did to improve the situation, we created a special set of provides in DNF plugins. Uh, basically, these provides are supposed to give you an idea, if, if you're trying, trying to use a command that doesn't exist because some commands were moved from core yum to uh, one of the plugins uh, uh, in DNF. DNF will give you a hint like try to use this provide, try to install this provide that might give you the functionality that you requested. Okay, so yum versus DNF major differences. Uh, I guess the message here is that uh, still Still, there are some u some users who think that DNF is supposed to be a drop-in replacement for YAM. Uh, I'm not sure why they think that. Uh, we have never said anything like that. Uh, we're trying for the CLI interface to be uh, as similar as possible, but not always the same. So DNF is not drop-in replacement for YAM. Uh, again, we should have been more clear about this. Uh, and yeah, uh, basically we should have we should have made clear that uh, DNF is not YAM and it's never going to be. But uh, on the other side, on the other hand, we have a great documentation. We have a FAQ. We have the man page I original uh, I already mentioned, and 
we have a web page with all the differences, or well, most of the differences that are between DNF and DM, and all these are supposed to help you with migration towards DNF. Uh, if you ask why is YAM different than DNF, uh, mo for most part it's because of the use case orientation of the uh, DNF crew. But yeah, there are some other reasons, uh, but this is the main one. So uh, let's take a look at the, let's talk about the incoming box. Uh, so Fedora Alpha was basically, Fedora 22 Alpha was basically the first point of contact for most of the users. Uh, so between Fedora Alpha and Beta, we got uh, 93 new bugs for DNF and related components. Between Beta and GA, we got 115 of those. And since GA, uh, we've got 100 more. And we have closed, since the alpha release, we have closed more than 400 bugzillas. Either uh, with fixes or as duplicates or as no debugs or as won't fixes, but we try to uh, maintain this number as, as low as possible. So here is a graph, if you're interested. This is the, uh, this is the amount of bugs that we, uh, that we got. Uh, this zero right here, that's the first week, that's the first week of this year. So here you can see uh, how many bugs were open, uh, open against DNF every week of this year, including the trend. So I guess because of the holiday, the, trends, the trend is down. Uh, the trend is getting down. I'm curious about September and October. <laughs> Hopefully, it will not get worse. Is this across all releases? Uh, yes, that's across all releases. What happened after week twenty? <laughs> Oh right, the spike. That, 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 that huge spike that's F22 GA. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, there, was a, there was a huge problem there because in Fedora 22 GA there was a release of DNF that was like a month old and oh. we got a lot of duplicates. So that's the spike you can see. Uh, so what do we plan? Uh, finally getting to the interesting stuff. Uh, so the big topic obviously is going to be migration, uh, the rest of the migration, and then I will review some other plans as well. So what do we plan? Removing YAM, big surprise. Um, we want to remove YAM, yeah. Um, so this is likely something that you are, that most of you are interested, of, uh, interested in, and why are you attending this presentation? So YAM has been in maintenance mode for more than 18 months now. That means only a small number of bug fixes are getting in and only a small, even smaller number of new features are getting in. Uh, currently we have one active YAM developer uh, and maintainer uh, who basically maintains mostly RHEL stuff, uh, some of the Fedora stuff as well. And James over, there, James over there is contributing from time to time as well, so it is not completely that, but uh, it's very close to it. So uh, let's take a look at three important aspects of the migration to DNF. So first of all, uh, it's going to be about migrating the users. So uh, YAM deprecated is staying in Fedora 23, even though we originally uh, we were all originally thinking about uh, getting rid of it. But yeah, YAM deprecated is staying in Fedora 23, and if everything goes well, it will be removed in Fedora 24. Uh, completely or made not to fall? Completely. If, if everything goes well. I mean, there is about 50% chance <laughs> that, this, that this is going to happen in Fedora 25, but uh, obviously the goal is for us not to have YUM in RHEL 8. So uh, by that time, not sure what which time it's going to be, but by that time we want to get rid of it. At least it can still be there, but not as a dependency of anything else. So uh, there are some important issues that we are currently tracking. Uh, the new DNF release was actually built today, uh, earlier today. So it, it fixes about 20, 20 important bugs and it adds a few enhancements as well. 
and we're hoping to get all these important uh, issues we have, there's about eight of them I think, uh, resolved by Fedora, 22, uh, Fedora 24 Alpha. So the second aspect, uh, migrating the applications. So currently there is 20 applications to go. Uh, there is a tracker bug uh, in Bugzilla. Uh, out of these 20, we sent patches to 10. So we are hoping that the maintainers will pick them up and merge them uh, upstream and in Fedora. And two more are likely to be dropped. Uh, I mean, two uh, depending packages. Uh, that leaves us with eight applications uh, remaining that need to be migrated from YAM to DNF. Uh, that's likely going to happen this autumn. Uh, migrating plugins, that's an on ongoing effort. I think we are pretty much done, but there might be one or two plugins that still need to be uh, migrated, obviously. Some plugins are missing the full compatibility, so we will work on that as well. Uh, like we're talking before the presentation and repo query is one of them. Uh, it's one of the more, more essential plugins. And then there are non-Fedora applications, which we obviously can track, at, cannot track at least for the most part. So I know for sure that we sent patches to Ansible to migrate to DNF. And the rest of the applications and their developers we are willing to provide any assistance they require. And like I said before, we have great documentation for them. Uh, third aspect, migrating the infrastructure. Any release engineering guys over here? None? Ah, oh, one, okay, cool. <laughs> so, uh, bottom line, I will, uh, I will talk to you guys about the plans for migrating to DNF. Currently, uh, the plan is to migrate to, well, yeah, to migrate in Fedora 25 timeframe. Not sure why exactly, that's what I need to talk to you about. Uh, what exactly? uh, basically the building infrastructure so mock is already ported right. uh, to DNF then there is Koji which uses mock but that is not ready to adopt DNF oh. but that should be fairly simple if I understand it correctly uh, and then on top of Koji uh, there are some other tools uh, like Pungi I'm not sure what is currently used if it's if it's Pungi as well uh, but yeah, release engineering has, has all these different sorts of tools to make, to create composites and stuff. So, uh, yeah. So that's about migration. Let's see about some other short-term plans. So API improvements for plugins. Uh, so as the, as the set of plugins that we have grows, we discover on a weekly basis that there are some parts that are just not good enough for plugins. Like how the configuration is processed. Uh, I can remember uh, a conversation between the original DNA developer and James over there. They were basically arguing about how the configuration management should be done. Uh, obviously the, DNA, the original DNA developer did it his way and surprise, surprise, we discovered that it might have not been the smartest idea. So uh, this is one of the examples of things that we need to improve in the future and like I said, Currently, we're quite okay, but if we, if we want more plugins to come our way, we will need to work on the API. Uh, downloading file lists. So, who noticed how much data DNF downloads every time? I did. Okay, <laughs> at yeah. least one person. <laughs> yeah, uh, the reason for that, that the YAM was optimized not to download file lists by default, and DNF does that. Uh, so this is something that we will we will definitely work on because there are still some uh, some deployments where the bandwidth usage actually matters. Uh, I mean, it makes the DNF depth solving faster, but at the same time, like I said, there are some uh, some places on the planet that this is actually a bad thing. So we will work on the bandwidth optimization. Uh, so. Will you provide the uh, configuration option to download the files? Yes, probably. I mean, I can I cannot say that with certainty, but uh, we because most likely will. Generally speaking, you know, all four faster than Yep. <laughs> Me too. I mean. <laughs> Do you have any stats on the differences? Uh, the differences, I don't have any stats, but my first guess would be that it's about. 
twice as much because the file lists are. No, the speed difference between when you have a file list and not. Oh, right. Uh, no, I don't have any stats I on that. I don't understand why it would be different. It just have to stop and download the file list if it needs to. So. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that when these metadata are downloaded from the servers, DNF needs to compile them into some sort of format that the uh, dependency solving library uses. So that's, that's the reason, basically. Huh. Uh, Rich dependencies. Uh, that's something that should be available in Fedora 23, even though I should not adver advertise it loudly, because it was not sanctioned by the FPC. But theoretically, rich dependencies should work. Uh, what are rich dependencies about? Basically, they allow you to use Boolean expressions in your requires, suggests, okay. uh, recommends, you know, stuff so like that. So those are in now to the point where we actually need guidelines. Because it wasn't that long ago that they weren't in, so we didn't yeah. even know. I mean, so the they last were asking what the syntax was. was yeah. Was okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean. There are guidelines. Not no, that's for weak dependencies. Oh, well, not rich. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the syntax is like in its alpha phase. That's why we don't recommend okay. to use them. Uh, there are some expressions that are still missing, like negation. Negation? No. Uh, and yeah, other than that, it, it works, but it's still like in an alpha development phase. And we, sh we hope it should be done by, by Fedora 23 GA, but. Uh, it's possible to start experimenting with experimenting um, with them. After talking, I'm staying in this room. Yeah, because I yes, we can we can definitely meet and talk about this some more. Uh, so, subscription manager search disabled repos plugin. Uh, not sure how uh, how valuable is that for Fedora if you're not using Spacewalk uh, mm. or uh, yeah. Is that but it? That's not even in Fedora anymore. That all left. Yeah, it's 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 possible. Anyway, this this started as a as a rel feature, but it's open sourced in YAM, so we plan to port it to uh, to DNF as well. The thing is that what can happen sometimes is that you have some enabled and disabled repositories, and when you install a package from one of those enabled repositories, it has a dependency that leads into one of those disabled repositories. So what this plugin yet what this plugin does. It basically asks you if you want to enable all the repositories that you have in your configuration and start a dependency solving again. And if it satisfies the dependency, it will ask you if you want that particular repository uh, enabled by default. Or yeah, basically, it's it's supposed to make your lives easier if there are broken depths. So some long-term long-term plans: uh, software database and integration with cache. Uh, the cache integration, I'm still not sure if that is a, is, if that is a short term or long term uh, plan because yeah, we basically want to improve caching. Uh, YAM has improved that recently and we want to bring that to DNF as well. The idea is to have a uh, more versatile uh, caching mechanism that will allow you to uh, store your packages without the need of like proxy server or anything like that. Uh, that is especially usable in, in Docker environment when you're building uh, machines using the same packages again and again. And software database, uh, that's uh, something we have been planning for quite a while. Um, the idea is to separate the database component of DNF, uh, create an API on top of that, and basically make it available to other applications uh, like PackageKit because PackageKit currently doesn't share the data with DNF. Um, okay. So the, one of the big missing features at the moment is that you can't do DNF security updates. Is that? On oh the yes, system? that's that's one of the plugins that we are uh, that we are currently working on uh, the security plugin mm -hmm. and. I was under the impression that's already in Fedora, maybe with one of the latest updates. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but we definitely know about this feature and uh, there is already work underway to make this available in Fedora. So yeah, for the recording, the question was that one of the big missing features uh, of DNF was the security update. 
uh, a security plugin, sorry. So let's take a look at some very long-term plans. Uh, these are mostly ideas at this point. Uh, not, no work is being done on those. Uh, and yeah, addressing the three different software management stacks problem. Uh, so currently we have YAM, we have DNF, and we have package kit slash GNOME software, which basically work well independently. So what happens, each of these, uh, each of these applications will download its own metadata. So all the metadata that you download, you need to download them three times if you use all, all three of those. There was a huge threat on Fedora Devil list about this uh, about two or three months ago. So that's something we definitely want to address. But it's not just about the metadata, it's also about the business logic. So we have YAM and we have DNF now. That's gonna be that's gonna be resolved sooner or later. But then there is package kit, which basically re-implements everything that we do in DNF. And GNOME software uh, ru is running on top of package kit, so DNF and package kit are not exactly like what you would call compatible. For example, you cannot use DNF plugins in package kit. The business logic might be a little bit different, even though the core pieces, the libraries like the depth solving library and the library for downloading the data are the same, the business logic on top of them is not the same. So we want to address that. We want to merge uh, some, of the some, of, some of the functionalities that we have and preferably uh, utilize the same library that will contain the business logic. Uh, transformation of the code to C or C++. Uh, there is actually a project called TinyDNF uh, that was started by VMware. They, their idea basically was to take our core pieces, the depth solving library, uh, the library for parsing comps, the library for downloading the data, and writing their own uh, command line utility on top of those libraries. So again, they duplicate our business logic. Well. Footprint, it's all about footprint, because VMware wants to use that for their container solutions. Oh, okay. And you know, with DNF, you still need to drag Python with you. So that's why we consider transforming DNF to C or C++ in time. Like I said, this is very long term plan. And uh, yeah, demonization, uh, that's another idea floating around. Uh, if, if DNF was running as a daemon, say, um, I don't know, like Docker, it might be possible to do a whole bunch of stuff that is not possible today, like uh, scheduling tasks for later, for example, or, I don't know, manag managing uh, non-root users uh, and their access rights. So non-root users might be able to install stuff. Isn't that package kit? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess it is, but... Uh, uh, there might be other other use cases. I mean, I always hear people talking about uh, non-root installable packages. So, oh, you mean running in stuff in your own home directory? Or yeah, I, I guess something like that. Uh, I mean, currently, uh, well, I'm not sure what's what's the deal with package kit, but uh, I'm pretty sure that, for example, GNOME software, which is, if I understand it correctly, our default. Uh, way to install stuff on Fedora desktop only uh, only displays those applications that have these descriptions, which might which might not be all of the packages. So, but again, this is this is just an idea, and we are still like uh, thinking through if if it's really a good idea or not. Just uh, okay. So how much? How much time do I have? Like five minutes, something like that. Okay, so uh, I was going to get a little controversial, but let's see if there are any questions before we go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, here's here are some of the topics that uh, we can talk about. So first of all, the name. People keep asking, why is it called DNF? is just a fork of YAM, so why don't we uh, keep the name and just release YAM4? My answer is that DNF is not YAM. That's why it's called differently. The APIs are, are different, the CLI is a little different, and 
at this point it's mostly about uh, managing user expectations. The, the, the major counter to that, right, is that the, the bulk of users that uh, understand how it's not young are all the ones who, whatever its name is, will understand that it's not young. And all the ones who don't know or care that it's not young will never understand that they have to now type different letters. Right. Uh, <laughs> So the comment was that the users that don't know why it's not called yum will never understand why it's not called yum, right? Well, well they don't care. Yeah, and they don't, they don't care. So they yeah, don't you're mind. definitely right, and that's why we are currently keeping the symlink, and the symlink will still be there for the foreseeable future. So, <laughs> because they just want their, you know, uh, yum command to work, they don't care about the name. It's not just that, they follow descriptions and things from websites and stuff, and that's yes. never going to go Exactly, uh, exactly. I would like to encourage you to think about making that yum yum symbolic not tell people to use the DNF and um, to make it smarter about, it. if it's something that it's pretty sure is just going to work, just do it and don't tell them to do something yes. else. Uh, like, that's like, and then the good example of this has been for years, NS Lookup for years and years told you, and that's looked up as deprecated, you should use digger host. And right. the only result of that was a bunch of sysadmins angry about that message and typing NS lookup and complaining more often. And I that's think right. that's gonna be yeah. the same result here. So I think we should just uh, that's right. Can, so the so the comment you can still have a little tagline that says brought to you by DNA. That's right. <laughs> right, yeah. So the so the comment was <laughs> that but you didn't hear that, yeah. you don't get bug reports from me because I give it a tip. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a system, so you don't count in this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, fair enough. Also, the funny thing is, you probably should have switched to host, but, um, and that was one of the things I often saw, I don't know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it's like a usability thing. People saw that switch to dig or host, and switch to dig, and then complained that dig was way the wrong <laughs> command to use. <laughs> and it um, never noticed the or host part, which right. is probably what they wanted. So, so yeah, for the recording, besides uh, a lot of off-topic discussion, <laughs> uh, the comment was that uh, we should not do just the warning to migrate to DNF, we should do like automatic translation from yum commands to DNF commands instead, where possible. And question to that is, yes, we know, and we plan to do something like that. Because that's, I mean, if the use case is as simple as installation of one package, there's no need for the user to you know, learn a new command. So I agree with you, and we will be working on that. Awesome. In relation to that, if you could make Ansible's yum module just work, <laughs> and civil uh, yum module? Yeah. 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 Oh, the DNF plugin does seem to be actually uh, shipping in the drawer. Th there is a DNF plugin, but it's still the case that you have to change your playbook to use it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, the question was about Ansible yum module, and I don't think we are going to work on that, but feel free. I mean, you're on the team, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, I think he's saying really, if yum, if yum can auto translate. Oh, right, okay, so, yeah. Well, the problem I have, actually, with it is not old ones as much as um, if I want to use the uh, same playbook on RHEL right. and yeah. on Kimura, I can't. Right, but yeah. And the actual problem there is the Ansible playbook imports the young Python API, mm. and it doesn't call the CLI. Right. So, anyway, uh, we're, we're out of time, so one last question. <laughs> Just wanted to know, about this discussion, what happens now if you type yum install whatever? It will warning you should use the and ends, or it will warning you and install whatever? Uh, it will try to redirect you to DNF in terms of like taking the arguments that you specified and calling DNF with those arguments, but that will not work every single time. There are times where you will end up with an error or something. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, anyway, if you guys uh, want to talk some more, I will be available. Uh, just grab me uh, walking in the hallway. And other than that, thanks you. thank you for listening.